بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلقه أجمعين وباء All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Complete blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His wives, his entire household, all his companions May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all And may Allah bless every single one of us and grant us all goodness Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam Yesterday we were looking at the birth, the most blessed birth that ever occurred. And that was the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The best of creation, the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for us to be from his ummah. So indeed, we are very, very fortunate. And as we say, it's about time we knew a little bit more about his life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The place that was chosen for this birth was Makkah al-Mukarramah. It is the center of the earth. If you take a look at where it is, it is the center of the earth. And there is the Kaaba that was built right at the beginning by Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam together with Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. And throughout history, it was rebuilt as and when the floods came in and sometimes destruction was caused by fires and so on. And it was rebuilt, but exactly on the same spot. We heard about the well of Zamzam yesterday, a very interesting story. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. Very important to note that the person who saw Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first, it is reported that a person known as Ash-Shifa, Ummu Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anha, the mother of Abdurrahman ibn Awf, one of the narrations say that she was the midwife. So obviously the midwife is the first one who takes the child and this is the great fortune of this particular lady, the mother of Abdurrahman ibn Awf, who later on became one of the wealthiest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that particular man. Also what is of importance is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was born, he did not have a father, as we said yesterday. His father had passed away already when he was seven months in the womb of his mother. And from this, we need to realize that Allah chose for the best of creation to be an orphan. So no one who is an orphan here should think for a moment that that is a negative point. It is one of the most positive points. When a person does not have a father, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces that with so many other virtues, so many other things, so many other people who take care. And sometimes they may have a difficult upbringing, but Allah presents for them opportunities that he has not presented for others. Look at this, the greatest leader of all, he, he was an orphan. And not only that, in Islam, the meaning of the term orphan is the one, who, the child who does not have a father, who lost his or her father, that is the orphan. If someone has lost a mother, they are not termed as yatim in the Arabic language on condition that they still have the father. But the minute they've lost the father, then they are considered yatim. This is the Islamic interpretation of it. Although from an English language perspective, it is a little bit different. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's father passed away when he was 25 years old, meaning the man himself, Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. And as for what happened to him when he was born, his grandfather loved him so much because Abdul Muttalib, who was the grandfather of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had already had information, as we said yesterday, from various parties telling him, you are going to be the grandfather of a child who is going to really be a leader and so on. So he took great care and he was very interested in this daughter-in-law, or should I say, uh, the little grandchild that was born and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in his heart love of this particular child, although he was meant to die just a little while later. So if we take a look, it's easy for us to say the mother looked after the child. But the man who was behind the scenes was Abdul Muttalib. He was there. And the mother looked after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam together with her slave girl. Very important for us to know who was the slave girl. Her name was Ummu Ayman. Ummu Ayman Baraka binti Thalaba. That was her name later to be known as Radiallahu Anha. She was a slave girl from Africa. And she was the slave of Amina binti Wahab. Subhanallah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, After my mother, I consider her a mother. Allahu Akbar. After my mother, I consider her a mother. Ummu Ayman Radiallahu Anha. 
She looked after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Some narrations make mention of how she was a, a witness. She also nursed Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam prior to him going to the uh, clan of Banu Saad, where he was nursed by Halima to Saadiyah. If we take a look at this, it is a great virtue. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam being looked after by so many people. And as he grew up, in fact, in his infancy, there was a habit amongst the people of Mecca at the time, Quraysh and the Arab clans and tribes that lived in the cities. In the cities, people swear, they shout, they scream, perhaps the air is not that clean. So they used to send their children to pure environment in the Bedouin villages. And there was a village known as Badia to Bani Sa'ad. Banu Sa'ad used to live there. It was one of the top villages where people used to send their infants to be breastfed with the pure milk. And when we say pure milk, non-contaminated. Today, subhanallah, we have a different type of contamination. And that is the genetically modified food that we have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from food that is bad for us. Sometimes we don't even know what is the content of what we are eating and we don't realize it is sometimes not fit for animal consumption. Forget about human beings and still we're busy eating it. And as they say in our language, just chow man, Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Food, it's up to us to make sure we are eating that which is halal and that which is healthy. So they used to send their children out to learn good language. The language was powerful, the manners, the mannerisms, the etiquettes. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was a little orphan. They were waiting for the people to come from Banu Sa'ad and from various other villages. So when the people of Banu Sa'ad came, there is a very, very interesting story. Khadija bint, sorry, uh, Halima to Sa'diya, who was ultimately taking Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, took him actually. Initially, when she was coming to Makkah al Mukarrama, she was riding with the rest of her colleagues who were also going out to look for people whom they could uh, look after in their particular village from Quraysh. And with that, because they were poor, they felt we would probably get a little bit of wealth from it. And perhaps people might give us something and we might earn a little bit and we can even look after these children and send them back to their folks after some time. So Khadija, uh, sorry, Halima to Saadiyah, she makes mention of something very interesting. She says the donkey I was on got injured on its knee and it began to bleed and it was slow and it slowed down. So myself and my husband, we arrived in Makkah after the rest of them had arrived and they had already selected the babies they wanted to take. The baby of the rich man, the baby of this man, baby of that person, baby of this elite and this elite. And when she came, there was one child remaining. Who was that? This was the plan of Allah for the donkey to be delayed. This is why we tell everyone, when you are delayed, don't worry. Allah has a plan. He knows why this has happened. Just say Alhamdulillah. Like they say, better late than never. And in some cases they say, better late than the late. Allahu Akbar. May Allah have mercy on some who have passed away. I heard this morning that there were some youngsters who passed away in KwaZulu Natal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them Jannah. They were granted a death in this particular month of Ramadan. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with them, to forgive their shortcomings and to be pleased with all of us and to also grant us a blessed death. So she was delayed when she came, she saw this orphan child. Now, no one wants to take an orphan child because there's no father figure here. Who is going to pay? Who is going to, you know, uh, be responsible and so on? So she thought, let me quickly have a peep if there is anyone else. If not, then she did not want to go back to her village without anyone. So instead of facing the others saying, you went all the way to Quraysh, you came back without a child. She then decided afterwards that, okay, let me take this orphan child. Allahu Akbar. She makes mention later on. And she says, we took the child and immediately we started feeling blessings. Jumped onto the donkey and suddenly the donkey became strong. And the wound of the donkey healed. Allahu Akbar. Weren't we talking about miracles? The wound of the donkey healed and suddenly it was one of the stronger donkeys and it was leading the pack. And we arrived in Banu Sa'ad and to our amazement, we found that the goats and the sheep that were there, the milk within the udders was already so much and we could never drink so much before. And now there was a surplus of milk. Subhanallah, something had happened and we found strangely it began to rain also. 
And what happened is the flowers came out, they began to blossom and the, the shrubberies and the little bushes and so on began to come out, the little bit of the greenery and so on. And we were amazed and there was so much blessing. She says, my breast milk was not enough for the one child and now there was so much that that child also stopped crying and this child also fed. And this child was so amazing, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that whenever he wanted to sleep, he would look up into the skies and then he would go to sleep. And whenever I removed his clothes to bathe him, he would cry until I clothed him once again. Subhanallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so many beautiful points she makes mention of. She actually speaks of how the house was full of blessing and how the entire Badia, the entire group of villages that was there was full of blessing. And he was not a child who used to be like the ordinary children fighting over small things. He was very calm and relaxed. And he grew up with the eloquence, speaking powerful language from the very, very early ages of his life. Powerful language. As I told you, Banu Sa'ad were like the best. They were the most sought after for people to take the children away. You know, there is a point I raised today, earlier on when I had a little radio program, that look at how the kuffar of Quraysh used to send their children away for benefit. We sometimes feel so clingy upon our children that we cannot send them in order to be a hafil for a year or two. And these people were ready to send them for dunya. And they were ready to send them for morals and character. We can't even part with our children sometimes. And we haven't even inculcated in our children how important it is sometimes to actually be separated from the parents in order for them to prepare for a day when they won't have those parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us foresightedness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our children and make us parents who are always exemplary making the right decisions. So here, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being in this particular badia with these children as he grew up, something happened. What happened? They used to play outside with the boys. They used to play with what? With the sheep and goats and so on. You know, little children in a little village out there and they used to play. And one day, his friend, the one who was also his brother, his foster brother, the one who was being breastfed by the same Halima to Saadiya, they were playing together and two angels came down. And the angels came down in white clothing. This young boy, the both of them saw the angels. And the angels put Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam down on his back, slit open his chest, took out his heart. And this young boy began to run. Run where? He ran straight to Halima to Saadiya. And he began to tell them what's going on. In the meantime, the angels had taken out this heart. They had brought a bowl, a golden bowl made of gold with Zamzam in it. For your information, the Zamzam had started gushing just before that because it was there from the time of Ismail alayhi salam, but it was clogged and it was re-dug by Abdul Muttalib as we learned yesterday. And now the same water was being used to purify. Purify the heart from what? Jealousy, hatred, deception, pride. And all these bad qualities, the quality of anger for the wrong reasons. Remember, when we become upset, we can become upset for the sake of Allah. But a lot of the times it's just for our own selves. Whereas Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is reported by Aisha radiallahu anha. She says, Man qattu. He never ever sought revenge for himself. He didn't get angry because someone wronged him. But he always did so when someone obviously went against the law and command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it would make him upset. And whenever he sought revenge and retaliation, it was solely for the sake of Allah, not never for himself. With us, sake of Allah, we can leave it to go by. But for ourselves, we won't let it go by. I'm going to fix him, whether now or tomorrow. But you're going to see what I'm going to do to him. Allah protect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala soften our hearts. Remember, it's shaitan who wants you to continue the circle. You do, he does. He does back, you do again, and so on. And it carries on and on for years on end, just like the jahiliyyah. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was purified. The heart was replaced. A little vein was taken from the back, just from the left side and the back, and it was removed. And this was, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explains in one narration, he says, you see, shaitan is like a little frog here on your left side. Whenever you are engaged in the remembrance of Allah, shaitan is silent. 
And the minute you are oblivious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He begins to whisper in your ear. Starts whispering what? Anything and everything. To start doing wrong and you know, divulge you like people read salah. And you know, a man reading salah one day, he says 250. What do you mean 250? 200, oh, okay, I mean salah, sorry. He was busy calculating what people owed him. Allahu Akbar. Because why? In salah, we're busy thinking of everything else. What am I going to do after salah? People are saying, there's a braai on tonight. This sheikh is taking too long. Come on. Taraweeh is finishing 9 o'clock. Imagine. And another 7 minutes for witr. What's going on here, man? Subhanallah. That goes through our minds because we are oblivious of Allah. You take out that shaitan, a little frog from there, throw him out, Allahu Akbar. How do you throw him out? By continuing to remember Allah. Thank Allah. He is giving you an opportunity that you may never ever get again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and grant us goodness. So when that vein was taken and it is reported that there was now a seal of prophethood there. What was it? It was a mark here, a little like a pea, the size of a small pea here. At, on his back and it had a few hairs like a mole we would say today it had a little bit of like a mark and it had a few hairs that grew out of it subhanallah and this was in a specific place on his back and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Halima to Saadiyah and them rushed out to see what was going on he was sitting there pale everything was over obviously and they asked him what happened and he narrated the story now they got worried they were worried for his life because you see, even prior to this, the grandfather was told so much. The mother had had a few signs here and there. Not a direct piece of information. Some people say the angel Jibreel came to the mother. No, that's wrong. The angel Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, did not come to the mother of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam. But there were other signs which were lesser signs to prove that this man is going to be someone important. You know, like nowadays we see a youngster, very, very intelligent. We say, watch this page. Watch this space. That's what some people say. Look at this young boy. He's going to be very important, inshallah. He's going to be a big man, inshallah. He's going to come and something, inshallah, big will happen. We're just guessing. But in that case, no guessing. It was something that was coming. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they took him and what did they do? They returned him. They went back to Mecca. And they saw the mother. And they saw the grandfather. And they said, we are returning this young boy. But why? No, we are busy. We have this. No, no, no. Tell us the reason. No, we have this excuse. No, no, no. Tell us why is it that you are bringing this child back? And then she says, well, this is what happened. There was the, the angels or someone came down. They slit the, the, the chest and there was a mark that was left on the chest. Subhanallah which remained up to the end and Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu says, I used to see the mark left by that cutting of the chest from the angels, subhanallah. Later on, even in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a little mark. Sometimes we have operations and then you have the visible mark for a long, long time. This only Allah knows exactly how it was, but there was a mark, subhanallah. So what could Amina do, binti Wahab? She accepted her child back, looked after the child with the assistance of whom? With the assistance of Ummu Ayman, who was her slave. And she treated the child very well. And subhanallah, it was something amazing. They had a beautiful bond and this lasted for a few years. But before I get into the death of the mother of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let me quickly make mention of something regarding Iblis. There is a narration that makes mention that Iblis was moaning four times, moaning, groaning, or you can even say crying four times. He was very arrogant, shaitan, the devil, Satan, very arrogant. He was very happy when he transgressed, but when Allah cursed him, he moaned, number one, he grunted, very upset. Secondly, when he was removed from Jannah, he was again very upset. Thirdly, when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was born, again, he moaned, groaned, he was very upset again. And the fourth one was when Surah Al-Fatiha was revealed, it is reported that he moaned and groaned again. So these were the four times when he moaned and groaned. The term used in the Arabic language is Ranna. Ranna meaning he actually rang. You know, there was like a sound coming from him so upset. So these were the four times that Iblis was very, very upset. And then if we take a look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as his mother had relatives in Medina Munawwara, 
She used to go there now and again. The father had passed away in Medina Munawwara. And as I told you, he also had relatives there. The mother went and once on her way back, she passed away in a place called Abuwa. And she was with her slave girl, Ummu Ayman. And Ummu Ayman took Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, looked after him, cared for him, returned him to Mecca and went straight to the grandfather whose name was Abdul Muttalib. How old was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when his mother passed away? He was six years old according to the vast majority of narrations. In fact, mentioning the date of birth, which we haven't said yet, I just realized we haven't said it yet. There are several narrations as to the precise date of birth, but the majority, the vast majority say it was the 12th of Rabi al Awwal. 12th of Rabi al Awwal. Which year was it? Now at that time, they did not used to work things out by years as in one, two, three from the beginning of time or so on. But a major incident that occurred, they used to work around it. Up to today, the Christian calendar works around some major incident that occurred. The Hijri calendar works around the Hijrah. So at that time, the major incident that really bewildered everybody was the incident of the elephants. So he was born in the same year that that had happened. So it was called Amul Fil, the year of the elephant. And I told you the correct narration is that there was one elephant, not a whole army of elephants, one elephant. And this is mentioned even in the Quran, Al Fil, one elephant. So if we look at this, he was born the year of the elephant, 12th of Rabi al Awwal. And thereafter, let's go back to where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's mother passed away when he was six years old. Ummu Ayman took him back to the grandfather. The grandfather loved him so much. And the grandfather treated him better than all the other children. So much so, he had 11 sons, Abdul Muttalib. And he had, as we mentioned yesterday, a place just near the Kaaba, upon the shade of the Kaaba. He had a little carpet laid for him, or should we say a little sitting place. When we say carpet, we're thinking of this proper carpet that is laid here. No, a different type of a carpet of that particular time, something to sit on. And that belonged to him, no one dare sit on it. But when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now, he was a young boy, above the age of six, between six and eight years old. And he used to crawl there quietly and he used to get onto it. And the uncles used to try and get him off it. And the grandfather used to say, no, let him sit there. And they were like amazed. This young youngster sitting there, we are not even allowed to sit on there. But the grandfather used to say, this young boy is going to be a leader. He's going to be someone great, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he continued to say things of this nature. And the grandfather fell ill at one stage. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was eight years old, the grandfather passed away. It was a very sad day. Take a look, an orphan with no father. Then the mother passes away. Thereafter, the grandfather passes away. So he is being shifted from one to the other. He has tasted the sadness in his early life, or should I say, the loss of loved ones. How many of us have lost loved ones? If you have lost loved ones, remember one thing. It is not a sign of the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a sign if you are to accept and digest a sign of a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you because he has favored Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the same gift and even more. So we are taught that in life, you won't always have everything rosy. No. Today we heard a beautiful verse that was recited in Taraweeh. You will definitely hear a lot of bad words. You will have to bear a lot regarding the statements of those who are polytheists and the people of the book. And this is why as Muslimin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, if you bear patience, then that is the best thing you could do. Today, people laugh at us. You want to grow a beard, you want to wear your hijab, you want to dress as a Muslim, you want to fulfill your salah, anything to do with religion. You want to be a Muslim and the people around you make it difficult for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So we were not promised that you are going to have a simple, easy go life. But 
you will have tests upon tests. The more tests you have, the more opportunities for you to pass. The more you pass, the greater the rank you will have in paradise. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the highest rank and he achieved it in many different ways chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his reaction was the best reaction possible for those particular difficulties that he had gone through. Look, lost a father, lost a mother, lost a grandfather. And thereafter, what happened? Well, his uncle took over. Which uncle? Abu Talib. And Abu Talib had other children as well. Abu Talib was a young uncle of his. And he had so many other children, he used to look after them. But he loved this little nephew. He loved him so much. Allah placed the love in the heart of the uncle and the grandfather before him. Sometimes you look at a child and you cannot help but love the child. The way they talk to you, the way they look at you, the way they carry themselves. Subhanallah. It's placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes you look at someone and you just want to look away because of the way they act and they behave and the way they carry themselves and so on. So it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who really does that where he puts it in your heart to love and he puts it in your heart to turn away. So this uncle, he noticed that he didn't have much wealth. But ever since he began to look after this young boy, there was so much blessing, so much barakah. And he found that he watched the children as they ate. When the little children came to eat all his own children, they would all go and try and snatch the best of pieces of food and so on. And this young boy came, he sat, he waited, and he knew that what was apportioned for him, he would get it. So he waited and then he would take like an adult already from that age. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had this perfect upbringing for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But perfect from which angle? Not from the angle of him having a father and a mother and so on and so forth. But his credentials were never dented from the very beginning. From infancy, nothing to say this man is a liar, he's a cheat, he had bad manners, morals, he was wrong in this way, that way, he had bad company, never ever. Subhanallah. He was powerful from that early age already, preparation for sending him to the people of Makkah in a way that they won't have a response unless they are to accept. That is the only response they could have had. Anything else would be out of their arrogance because they know the man and they know him from his birth and they know how high in character, conduct and morals he always was. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam grew up in this house full of humbleness, humility. And he used to go out to look after the sheep and the goats. And we made mention of this very briefly yesterday, but I'd like to repeat it. Sheep and goats, all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looked after these. And some of the benefits were to instill within this human being who was being prepared to come out as a prophet, lots of patience. With animals, you need so much patience because you can't even talk to them. Subhanallah. And thereafter, Humbleness, humility, because you've got to do so much and you are, you are down to earth. You, your clothes are messed. Sometimes you have to clean. Sometimes you walk over that which is unclean and so on. And a lot of humbleness is also achieved by this. And at the same time, you will find that over and above the patience and the humbleness, there is dedication. When one little animal is out away from the rest of the flock, you find the shepherd will always make an effort to go and get it. You don't just leave one. And then you develop a link with these animals. And even though you cannot communicate properly with them, they understand you to a certain extent and you begin to understand them. Then you lose one. You, one might die. A few might die. Something might happen to one and the other one, something else might happen to it. One may be stolen and so on. All this is part of the training with full humbleness and humility. With us, when someone tries to put us into a difficult situation, we get upset, we get angry, not realizing, Ya Allah, you are the one who chose this for me. Perhaps you are preparing me for something greater. Perhaps there is something to come in my life that you have now made easy for me from the training that I'm receiving now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was taken by his uncle, 
sometimes on some of the journeys that they went with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they used to have as we mentioned Rihla to Shita'i was Saifi. So when they were coming down to Yemen once, they were coming down to Yemen in the winter with a caravan. And what happened is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a young man, young boy in his early teens. And as they settled down in one area, a huge camel came charging for the whole group and they all scattered and went away. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was standing there alone. And as it came, he just stood there and everyone had run. And when it came to him, it stopped suddenly, sat down. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put his hand on it and calmed it down and then jumped on it and rode it to where they were. They were shocked. Subhanallah, what a sign. This man has calmed down even the animal. Do you know there is a story of Fudala? Fudala was a man who intended to kill Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hunayn. And what did he do? He was one of the Bedouin Arabs who was a marksman, sharp man. He took a khinjar, a knife, a pointed knife, which was jagged, which would slit anyone. And there they had no value for life of people especially at war. So Hunayn was later on in the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life. It is reported that 11 times they tried to murder him and 11 times Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala saved him. So one of the times Fudala, what did he do? He pretended to be a Muslim and he joined the Muslim army in Hunayn. And he was waiting, waiting for which opportunity? When I see a good opportunity, I'll slit this man's belly open and it's over. So as he went, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned and looked at him. Ya Fudala. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put his hand on the chest of Fudala and looked in his eyes. And you know what happened? Fudala says, instantly my heart was filled with love for this man. Instantly, instantaneous. And he says, he asked me, he says, Oh Fudala, what is it that you want? So he says, Astaghfirullah. Obviously now he's repenting here. What is it you want? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I came with the intention to kill you, but I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And you are indeed a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine, this was a story that happened later on in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So the animals also, subhanallah. In fact, so much so, it brings tears to the eyes when we think of a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Inni la a'rifu hajaram bi makkata. He says, I actually know a rock in Makkah that used to greet me. Allahu Akbar. The rock in Makkah used to greet him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to understand how fortunate we are to be following such a powerful message of the most powerful of all messengers. Many of us take it for granted. It's about time we did something about it. And it's about time we learned. This is the man through whom inshallah we will be entering Jannah. He has been granted the power to intercede. May Allah grant that to us. And we would like for us to be recognized on that day as part of his ummah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on another journey when he was going up to Asham, the Syrian region as we would call it today, but not only the country of Syria, it would include Lebanon as well as Palestine and some areas there. When they were heading up north, they used to stop at a certain monastery with the caravans. And when they stopped at one monastery, what happened is amazing. The monk never ever came out to meet these people. His name was Bahira or Buhaira, depending on how you want to pronounce it. He never used to come out. But that day he saw something and he came out to greet them. And he started greeting them and he asked, who is this man? Who is this young boy? And they told him this and this. So he called the guardian and he said, watch this young boy. Be careful. He is going to be someone and be careful. Be careful of the Jews. This is his statement. It's mentioned in the books of history because they are a very jealous nation. This is what he says himself, the monk. And thereafter, he decided to go in and prepare a meal and so on. And when they were preparing a meal, they everyone sat down and he says, where is this young boy? They said, no, he's out there with the animals. Call him, call him. And as they called him, something strange happened. What happened? Everyone was already sitting in the shade of the tree. And the monk noticed that when this young boy came, there was no shade left. So he sat down 
and the tree turned slightly, slightly, and it shaded him. And he says, look at this, look at this, it's a sign. This is the young boy, this is the boy, he will be sent one day. Now the details are coming out. This was the first incident where there was one of the most direct pointers at this young man being a messenger of Allah. For your information, this was one of the first incidents or the first incident where there was a direct pointer in that particular direction. And this was by a monk. And this is why we say the people of the book, not all of them had changed the books and so on. There were some who were honest. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran that some of those they believed, they did not hide the verses and they said it outward, openly. Like we will see later on, Waraqa bin Nawfal as well was one of those who uttered the truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So this was also a sign. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The monk told uh, Abu Talib to take this young boy away. He says, take this young boy away. Let him go back. Make sure that he comes back and look after him carefully. Don't let him travel towards the Roman Empire up to the Byzantine Empire. No, he shouldn't go there. If the Romans get hold of him, they perhaps will kill him because they wouldn't want a messenger to come from amongst the Arabs. All the messengers have been from them so far. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him and he was returned to Makkah al Mukarramah and thereafter safeguarded all the time. So much so that when he took part in building the Kaaba and he had his back open and so on, his uncle told him to cover his back. Subhanallah. So that he could be protected from the stones. But one of the underlying reasons was also the signs would not be seen by others because he had to be preserved. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Little did they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the protector. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect every single one of us. I'd like to go back to the story of Ummu Ayman. Very, very important person in the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he married Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha, she still looked after him, meaning she was still serving him. And he decided to free her at the time because he inherited her from the mother, from his own mother. And he freed her. And later on, when Islam started and Nubuwa, prophethood came, one of the first people to accept Islam, it is reported she was one of the first women after Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha, was Ummu Ayman. She was working with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa a woman from Africa who was a slave, who was freed. Listen very carefully, it brings tears to the eyes. She accepted the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You are definitely a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've watched you from the moment you were born and I know what's going on. And she outlived Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Later on in the life of Ummu Ayman radiallahu anha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided to make an announcement. What did he say? Whoever wants to marry a woman from Jannah, she, they should marry Ummu Ayman. Imagine. Whoever wants to marry a woman from Jannah should marry Ummu Ayman. This woman who was married before, she was the mother of Ayman. She had had a child before previously. On top of that, she was a slave. On top of that, she was from Africa. On top of that, she looked after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He freed her. And now he is saying whoever wants to marry a woman from Jannah should marry Ummu Ayman. And who got up and married her? None other than the most beloved to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Zayd ibn Haritha. He was much younger than her much younger than her. He married her. And who did she give birth to? She is the mother of Usama bin Zayd radiallahu an, one of the youngest leaders of the Muslim armies. She is the mother, Ummu Ayman. And where did she pass away? She passed away later on in Medina Munawwara and is buried in Baqi' radiallahu anha wa anis sahabiyyati wa anis sahabati ajma. May Allah be pleased with all the sahaba radiallahu anhum. They sacrificed their lives. And look at these people. It is reported that Zayd ibn Haritha was very, very white in complexion. And Usama bin Zayd was very dark in complexion. So much so that people used to accuse the child of being not from this particular father until one day they, they were sleeping in the masjid. And the two feet were sticking out of the other side of the cover, the sheet. And one mudlaji, a person who was an expert in lineage, he came and as he's walking past, he didn't know the story. He looked at the feet and he says, Inna hadihi al ba'duha min ba'd. These feet, some of them belong to the other. They are part of one, one and the same. 
So everyone was relieved to say subhanallah. People used to say things. So the complex, sometimes it comes from the lineage, from the family. His mother was from Africa. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May we be from amongst those who understand and realize. Look at where we are today. Sometimes we go backwards. And yet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making a beautiful announcement. And this was Ummu Ayman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her. Now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was young, he took part in several incidents, several great matters that occurred. One of them was known as Hilful Fudul, the pledge that was pledged in one of the houses in Makkah al Mukarramah. Let me give you a quick synopsis of what happened. There was a man from Yemen who had come up to Makkah and he was known as Zabidi because he was from those people of Zabid. So this Zabidi man, he had come with a bit of merchandise and so on and he was dealing with a man known as Al As ibn Wa'il, the father of Amr ibn al-As. Al As ibn Wa'il died as a non-Muslim but Amr ibn al-As was a great Sahabi and we know he was one of those who conquered Egypt. And this Al As ibn Wa'il cheated the Zabidi out of his wealth. Because this Zabidi wanted to go out to the, to the Kaaba and do his tawaf and what have you with the idols and whatever it was. So he left this wealth with Al As ibn Wa'il. And he, when he came back, the man says, there's no, nothing for you here. What do you mean? I gave you all my wealth. You're telling me there's nothing for me here. So he started calling out. Now Al As ibn Wa'il was one of the seniors in Quraysh. No one dare take his name. And if he, this man had gone to people to tell them anything, they wouldn't believe. Anyway, he did go to a few people and say, Allah As ibn Wa'il has stolen my wealth. And they said, what are you talking about? That can never be. This is one of the noblemen here. So he says, no, he has stolen my wealth. And he went, nobody helped him. And in fact, he was oppressed because his wealth was usurped by the people of Quraysh. There was one way he was going to achieve assistance. He had eloquence of the tongue, this Zabidi. He got up Jabal Abi Qubais. He got up one of the mounts there near the Kaaba and he started singing his poems. What were the poems? The poems were making mention of how Quraysh stole his wealth and how Al As ibn Wa'il has stolen his wealth and they are thugs and robbers and they're all in cahoots and so on. And he started singing some poems and you know, I told you yesterday, they were crazy about poetry. A man's status would raise because of poetry and a man would be considered a leader and a chief because he came with something powerful. This man came with powerful words that lasted up to today. For your information, they were all negative about Quraysh and about what had happened. So they wanted to do set things right because they did not want that. They did not want that to go down in history. So what did they do? Well, very interestingly, a few of them got together. And one of them was Az Zubair ibn Abdul Muttalib. You see Abdul Muttalib, this, the leader of Quraysh, his son, one of the uncles of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He got together five of the different families and their leaders, five of the leaders. And what he said, he said, look, we need to do something. This man has sung, meaning he has recited a poem here and that's going to go down. We are going to go down as people who are robbers. We need to agree on something. Now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was also invited as one of the members and he was a young man it's reported he was in his 20s and he went in and he was invited to witness this great treaty of human rights what was it it was known as hilful fudul the pledge of the virtuous what was the pledge of the virtuous they agreed that we will all unite to help the one who is oppressed. That was the main treaty, the main point of that whole treaty. All of us will unite and we will help the one who is oppressed and we will challenge or fight the one who is the oppressor. Allahu Akbar. Later on, Muhammad sallallahu says, I attended a treaty, a covenant in the period of ignorance if in the house of Abdullah ibn Jad'an. That was the house in which it occurred. If I was called to something similar to that today, I would go back and I would sign a similar treaty. Subhanallah. So the house of Abdullah ibn Jad'an was chosen. He was a man, I, we mentioned him yesterday. He was from a very uh, poor background, but he found some treasures and he kept those treasures and that made him rich and he used to help people a lot. So it, they called this covenant in his house and they agreed. And then they went on to Al-As ibn Wa'il knocking his door. 
And when he flung the door open, he notices these five people and they asked him, where is the wealth of this Zabidi? He says, hang on, here it is. Amazing. Look at how powerful. So it needs us to unite against oppression. As we said yesterday, you allow it to happen, it will continue happening. But someone somewhere somehow needs to stop it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned to us in the Quran as well. وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا اِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ Don't ever let the fact that you dislike a people make you oppress them. Always be just, for indeed that is the closest to piety. So you don't like some people, so you lie about them. You don't like people, so you make life difficult for them. You don't like people, so you want to fight them. Allah says, no, even if you don't like people, be just, because that is piety. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us justice. So this was as far as Hilful Fudul went, and this is the covenant that we were speaking about. Uh, one of the things that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had attended, and he was known as an honest man. He was protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his youth from attending the parties and so on that the youth used to attend. There is narration mentioned of one incident where he was with the flock of sheep that he was looking after and there was a wedding in the city. So he told his friend, look, please, can you look after this? I'm going out tonight. I need to attend the wedding. Or when he went there, there was a lot of wrong things happening, dance and so on with uh, different types of beat of the drum and music and so on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to protect Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah made him yawn and made him sleepy. So he slept and he did not take part in it. So he had gone there, but he slept away. And the next day he went there and he slept. The third day he went there, he slept. And he comes back to the shepherd and the shepherd says, but what did you do? He says, I did nothing. And he realizes that this is protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he promised saying, I will never ever attend any functions of this nature. Never. So that was the first and the last. Subhanallah. May Allah strengthen us as well. Wallahi, if we want to correct our weddings in Islam as Muslims, and we want them to stop being functions of earning the pleasure of the devil, rather than earning the pleasure of Allah, all we need to do is don't go. That's it. If half the community don't go, everybody will change because they now know I must have a separate function. I must make sure that there is no music playing here. And I must make sure that everything is Sharia compliant here because the community is not going to come. But we are collectively guilty of supporting such filth. And for that reason, a great act of worship known as Nikah, an act of worship of the celebration of such a great act of worship, the Walima, which is the second act of worship, we attend it and our own girls and boys are dressed in a way that would be such an embarrassment, people may mistaken them for prostitutes. May Allah protect us. It's a fact. I have pressed a red button because it's going on today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Really, there is no point in attending. Even if they've got a little commentary box in the corner separately for ulama, you don't attend that. That's an insult to the ummah. How can they be? The Muslims are in that little corner. The rest of us are having a ball of a time, as they say, a jol. Allah protect us. I don't even know what that means. We just heard it from people. Hey, we had a fun, man. It was lacquer, man. You know the language we use? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Really. What was nice? There was one uncle who had attended a function and he said, hey, there was a smoke screen. And you know, the way the man parachuted down and the way this happened and that happened and it was mixed total and it was free for all. And they're saying, but brother, you have such a big beard, mashallah, what were you doing? He scratched his head. Two seconds, he said, well, if I wasn't there, who was going to tell you what happened? Allahu Akbar. Look at the excuses shaitan makes us have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So as we were saying, you want to solve a problem, it can, but we need to be collectively ready to solve a matter. And remember one thing, do not compromise when it comes to nikah. Don't try and show people I had a bigger function and this function, simple function, even if you have invited just a head from all of the homes and that's it. Believe me, the more simple the function, the more blessed it is. Today, one of the reasons why divorce is almost 60% and marital problems are beyond 90% of marriages. Why? Because the seed we sowed was a seed of a cactus. 
and then we expect apples. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Obviously, every time I say something of this nature, I see everybody's looking at me like they want to eat me up. You know, what you saying? Because we've already married and we did all these things. Well, there is always room for tawbah. Always room to ask Allah for forgiveness. That will clean your slate once again. Say, Ya Allah, we did it wrong. Forgive us, but we will make sure we don't do it wrong for our children, no matter what. Don't try and be proud to show people, hey, I've got a bigger wedding and this. No, you can have whatever size you want, but make sure it is compliant and it achieves the pleasure of Allah. That is a day of happiness. We want the marriage to work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he grew up, he was known as an honest man. I mentioned the one incident where he attended this function and he promised never to go back to those functions again. Another incident was where they wanted in a place known as Buwana, they used to have a little uh, festival where they used to worship their idols. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from his infancy and childhood never ever worshipped idols. Never ever. Not once. And he always had something against these idols because it's just like Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam recognized at an early age. What's this thing here? It can't even help. He went to speak to those idols, Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, and you know, no response. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once refused to, to go to Buwana where they were worshipping the idols or he refused to worship the idols and his uncle was very upset with him. And so in his mind he thought what should I do and so on. In the interim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel to block him and immediately he realized that I'm never going to do this. Never ever. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From that early age he used to wonder, he used to think, all these things, these people, they are engaged in so much filth and activity that is really against the maker. They're worshipping sticks and stones. They're treating their women unfairly. They are usurping wealth of people. They are doing this and that. And he used to try and think of solutions. And he was always truthful, honest, although a lot of those around him used to have a few lies here and there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So he was known from an early age, Allah's planning, as As-Sadiqul Amin. The truthful, the trustworthy. You couldn't trust him with anything. He was known as that. So this news began to spread. And when it spread, it got to the business people of Mecca. From amongst them was a woman. Her name was Khadija bint Khuwailid, later to be known as Radiallahu Anha. She was a middle-aged woman who was married twice before and had had a child known as Hala. So what had happened? Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha heard that this particular man in Mecca known as Muhammad, very honest man and very trustworthy. His character is one of the best, the best in Mecca. So she invited him to do business on her behalf. She was a woman, she would stay in Mecca, but he could go up to Asham and come down. That was Allah's planning. Why? When you're going up to Sham and the Syrian region, you pass Medina Munawwara. And the Prophet ﷺ became acquainted with Medina and its people from a very early age. Did we ever know that? And he already passed there and he would go, stop over, continue, go up and so on. Literally today, we call it a container business. Nowadays, we have a ship coming from, mashallah, China and Hong Kong and Taiwan. It's a ship. It comes and it docks in Durban and then we're busy following it by phone. And we've got this agent and that agent. This, at that particular time, this was equivalent to the containers that people of this part of the world are acquainted to. Or acquainted with. So, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to go with the caravans. And Khadija radiallahu anha, at that time, she sent her slave known as Maysara with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she said, you go with him. And he noticed this man respected him. Imagine a slave. People, today we treat our, those who work for us are not even slaves. They are free like me and you. And we treat them so badly. We swear, we shout, we overburden them. And we tell them so much and we still call ourselves followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What a shame. We are insulting our religion. People, you know, when they go back to their villages, after when the holidays are there, they sit and they discuss, oh, I work in Nirvana. Where's that? Oh, it's in Polokwani. You know, I work for these Muslims. I, they can swear. They shout. You know, the uncle wanted to beat me also. And all of them get a bad picture of Islam. Do we know that? And the same people, when they sit around the fire in the village at the month end or at the end of the year, and they say, you know what? We have Muslims. They look after us. They respect us. They don't give us food that is fit for the bin, but they give us a portion of what they've cooked. Allahu Akbar. 
Allahu Akbar. Wallahi, I'm not lying to you. These are facts. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam treated Maysara, who was a slave with utmost respect, dignity. A man afforded the, the credentials. Subhanallah, he was given whatever a man deserves. And at the same time, honesty. No usurping. Imagine you've got millions of hands. You and someone else say, you know what? Just don't say anything. You take some, I take some. That doesn't happen, inshallah, amongst Muslimin. But there's a lot of people who do do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did not do that. Honesty. Every cent, every little coin was accounted for. And so much blessing in business. When the caravan used to come back with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet was so much, there was so much blessing. Khadija binti Khuwailid radiallahu anha, she had a friend. Her friend was known as Nafisa bint Munabbih. And she tells her friend, hey, you know what? This guy here is worth getting married to, man. What a man. Look at him, honest. My, the slave has come back to me and he says, this man is of high morals and standards, the highest I've ever seen. And the man is full of respect and dignity. Everyone, honest. He doesn't even usurp a single fraction of the wealth. So she went to him one time. You see, the women sometimes they have guts, you see. So she went to him and she suggested, hey, what's happening here, you see. Now look at this woman, older than him by quite a bit, married twice. And both of the husbands passed away, one after the other. You know, in our community, there's a widow. Only Allah knows how we look at her. Yet the hadith speaks about the lofty rank of those who support widows and orphans. A sa'i, the one who supports widows and orphans, is equivalent to the one who stands in salah all night, every night, and the one who fasts all day, every day. That's the reward. So this widow, she sends, or this friend went to say this, and he... After a while, whatever he may have done, he felt a little bit positive about it and he spoke to his uncle. It is reported he spoke to Abu Talib. It is also reported that he spoke to Hamza and Hamza radiallahu anhu went with him to Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha and her family. And they made a proposal in what we would call they became engaged, so to speak. They agreed that we would get married. And the marriage was then attended by Abu Talib himself and a few others. And in such a little while, they were married. For your information, today we have engagements. In Islam, there is nothing like these engagements. If you look at it, what is an engagement in Islam? It is just the mere confirmation that these two will be getting married. That's all. Nothing else. Today we have a big function, bigger than the walima, is an engagement. And after that, what happens? We phoning everyone, it was broken, you know, broken. You see, that guy was a rascal, you know, we didn't know. We found out later. Why? Because you did it the wrong way. You don't need a big engagement. Get the nikah done as simple and straightforward and inshallah, let them start living together. An engagement, the way we do it today, where a year later we have a nikah, that one year we only allow them to engage in sin. That's all that happened. Nothing else. Nothing positive can come out of a prolonged, prolonged engagement. I see some of the youngsters are smiling. Perhaps this is a good point for their fathers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us as parents. You don't need to wait. Allah has provided for you and Allah has given you. Make it easy for them. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thereafter got married to Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha and she was much older. The narrations that are most common make mention of his age and her age. His age was 25 years old when he got married according to everyone. And her age was 40 years according to the majority. Some say that she was 28 years old. This is obviously just a narration. I'm making mention of it for you to know that there is a narration of that. But we all know that the vast majority say she was 40 years old. She was already divorced. Sorry, she was already widowed twice. And this was her third husband. And this was his first wife. And he married her and he did not marry any other woman whilst she was alive. Radiallahu anha. And for your information, those who say he was a pedophile, a'udhu billah. Those who say he was full of lust and desires, not at all. If that was the case, at this young age of 25, he would have chosen the best of girls of the whole of Quraysh. As it is, he had a very lofty name in Quraysh. But he decided to go for someone who was mature. And it was Allah's plan, because for your information, Allah had already made Khadija binti Khuwailid with qualities that were needed in order to comfort Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the day revelation came. 
So this was all the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her and she is the one who bore his children and he had six children from Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha. Two boys, they both passed away. One died in childhood. His name was Al Qasim. Childhood meaning not infancy, but they say he could jump onto an animal. He could jump onto the horse or the camel. And at that age, he passed away. Al Qasim. And this is why he is also known as Abu Al Qasim, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the other one, his name was Abdullah. He passed away in infancy. Imagine those who've lost children, even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has lost children. And here you have both of his boys lost. Later on, there was another boy by Maria al Qibtiya. We will get to that inshallah. Ibrahim, he was also lost. But this was all prior to prophethood. And he had four girls Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima. May Allah be pleased with all of them. They lived. When he came with prophethood, they accepted Islam. When they all made hijrah as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness from the seerah. This is only a tip of the iceberg, inshallah. We hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases the love we have in our hearts for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a way that it can be seen on our physical features and faces. And in a way that inshallah will result ultimately in us earning Jannah through obeying the instructions that were from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came to us through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until we meet again tomorrow to continue this episode we say wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdih subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk